Thanks, Chris. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host, Mary Fran Johnson, CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media and a contributing columnist on CIO.com. We're streaming live to you right now on LinkedIn and YouTube on the IDG Tech Talk channel. And we welcome any of our watching and listening viewers to join in our conversation today with questions of your own. We'll be watching for those. One of the editors I work with is keeping track and she will be passing them along to our guest today and we'll do our best to answer them. And I'm very pleased to be joined today on CIO Leadership Live with Devin Valencia, who is the CIO of CareSource. Devin leads all aspects of IT and informatics at CareSource, where she oversees strategy for all of the systems, technical infrastructure, development, IT operations, and compliance. Headquartered in Dayton, Ohio, CareSource is one of the nation's largest Medicare managed care plans, serving about 2 million members across five states and supported by a growing workforce of 5,000. CareSource also offers a diverse range of government insurance plans on, health, the, on the health insurance marketplace, including Medicare Advantage plans that help consumers close the gap of coverage as they age. Devin joined CareSource in June of 2019, bringing along with her extensive experience in improving the accessibility of technology within the healthcare industry. Before her current role, she spent 16 years with Blue Shield of California, most recently as divisional CIO for their Medicaid, Medicaid programs. Named recently as one of the 50 most powerful women in technology by the National Diversity Council, Devin added another honor, honor, um, another honor to her list recently with, by Modern Healthcare Magazine, which picked her out as one of 2021's women leaders to watch in healthcare. It's great having you here today, Devin. Great to be watching you in person. Thanks, Mary Fran. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. That's really, it's, it's our pleasure, and I think it'll be our audience's pleasure as well. Uh, let's start out, let's fly up in our helicopters to that 30,000 foot view and talk about disruption, which is our way of life these days, the kind of the impact that the pandemic and the COVID crisis has had on healthcare companies is probably more deeply felt and more significant than almost any industry. So tell me how things have been for all of you at CareSource. Yeah, well, what a year. And it's interesting, you know, we certainly thinking about it from a, a company lens, but I think for all of us, it has been a year that none of us could have expected um, from, mm -hmm. you know, remote work, to, uh, you know, just impact to all of us, to our families, to our friends, to our children uh, and workforce. And, and you're right, in particular, uh, in the healthcare space and in the work we do, which is we do we do predominantly Medicaid, which is mm -hmm. uh, tends to be folks who have not a lot of access. They have high acuity, multiple acuities. They may be homebound and in long-term care. We do it was a lot for our members and, um, and really thinking about how we help them. And so as we got through that, got all our employees working and productive, you know, now we're shifting to thinking about vaccinations. How do we get everybody back to normal and vaccinated and back to work? So yeah, yes. it's been quite a year. I know it's it's kind of like one crisis piling on top of another. Um, and you had noted when we talked earlier that you are probably busier than you ever have been just as a company that is dealing is dealing in Medicaid and other government health care programs. Why are you busier than ever before? Well, there's two things. One is we're, you know, we're anti-cyclical, right? So Medicaid, you get a larger portion of Medicaid members when the economy is rough, right? So people opt out of okay company, you know, corporate employment and into the government plans. And so, and, and I think there's just been a lot of emphasis on, you know, healthcare equity and access and affordability. So it's stuff we're all very invested in and there's just a lot going on. You know, I think we've also taken the opportunity in the middle of the pandemic to, um, the pandemic, at a, I would say at a global and national level has amplified where we have gaps and where we've got to double down in the healthcare industry We've got a lot of things that were in flight and they're going faster than they ever have before because I think people are recognizing um, not just hypothetical scenarios, but realizing we've got to make changes in how we do work and how we give care, how we get people to see their doctors mm -hmm. virtual over video and things like that. So. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, and you had pointed out too that healthcare has been one of the last industries to really make it fully into the digital age. And I saw there was a quote in the Wall Street Journal today from a Bank of America technology leader who was basically summing it up, uh, which I think is very universal now. Digital demand is here to stay. That's not going away. Now the question is, how can we serve people in more ways or serve our yeah. customers or our patients in more ways? Um, talk about how the tech now the technology organization when you joined in mid 2019 so you had almost a year with kind of regular business growth and then of course the pandemic hits what has that done to your capabilities the talent you have the investment how much did how much has CareSource needed to double down on all of that during the pandemic yeah well, I think we were, I think we consider ourselves very lucky. I think working as stewards of the government business, we have a lot of things that we've already had in place. So for example, we had a pandemic playbook. We take things like security, disaster, recover, resiliency very seriously because we work for the states uh, and we are stewards of their money. So we had a lot of things already in place, which is great. So from an infrastructure perspective, we had a lot of things to rely on. We kind of we're ready to test them out. We didn't really expect to test them quite at the scale over a weekend. You know, within three right. days, we went from everybody in the office to with over the weekend uh, to 98% of our employee base being fully remote and on virtual. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, one I think is pretty common for everybody. How do you have a remote workforce? I think the other part, too, was, um, you know, we had a lot of things in flight and it's really accelerated those things. So things right. like patient care, telemedicine, which has been very uh, but, you know, it, it, so a lot of the things in the healthcare space, and again, we talked about this, you know, digital, you have a very digital experience with Uber and with Amazon, and then you go to the doctor and fill out a piece of paper and, you know, like for, say, hey, I want my kids to play sports. I got to go to the doctor's office, get a piece of paper that certifies their vaccinations. There's a lot of, it's very complicated, our medical records and such. There's a lot to be done. And I think regulators and I think physicians and health plans um, all see the need for a serious and investment and and to think about the continuum of those things because yeah. just because you have health insurance with care source go to multiple doctors mostly right and so mm -hmm. how do we connect all that data so that the consumer has a fantastic experience and, and the best care possible yeah. Well, and I think a lot of us have noticed, I think in just the last year or two, I've had the, the there's a lot of acquisition going on in the healthcare industry. And, right. you know, one healthcare system I thought I was part of got acquired by another one. And all of a sudden, everything changed, including my, my you know, my mobile app uh, and that sort of thing. And what, what have you been noticing about the expectations that your patients and they're not they're not really your patients they're your insured uh for the government plans have their expectations been changing on what they will look for as you said they you know they're used to amazon and uber and all the digital button pushing that we do how does that play out in what they ask from care source these days yeah, I think there's a, a couple of dimensions to this, and I think we're seeing it, and I do think we're going to see a whole lot more. And, and reality is consumerization of the healthcare environment is what we need, because that's what's going to drive and permanently drive change. So members expect a few things. They expect, so they, there's a lot of choice, right? Even in Medicaid, uh, you can choose a plan that has the coverage of your doctor and, and choose a doctor, right? And so those uh, members are looking for a digital experience, the ability to do telehealth, the ability to to get things electronically, have access to their own, um, to their health records, et cetera. So mm -hmm. you see that a lot and members are expecting that. And, and they expect, uh, I think one of the biggest things that's a concern for folks is the cost of healthcare. And yeah. one, you know, premiums are expensive and people get unexpected healthcare bills, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's another component. I mean, you don't go to Amazon when you push, you know, you put something in your, um, in your cart to check it out, the price doesn't change from the time you looked at it on the screen to the time you got to your door. In the healthcare space, things can be very, there's not a lot of transparency in pricing. And so I think those are all things that consumers are going to drive change for and companies are going to drive change for and regulators too. That's a good. Well, and uh, you had mentioned when we talked before too, that um, with, especially with the government healthcare plans, you have to meet people where they are. That's not just going to be, um, that they need to get to a doctor. They have, because of low income status and other things, 
they need to work with food banks or arrange transportation. So does that, as, as a CIO, does that make it a lot more complicated in terms of how CareSource works with those clients? Yeah, I mean, I would say complicated and I actually would say much more fascinating and interesting. I love what we do. Mm -hmm. what, you know, one of the things I, we've talked about, is it's fairly common. I just don't know if it's, it's commonly known, certainly in the healthcare arena, but I don't know if it's commonly known outside. When we think about a healthy person, only 20% of health is based on your ability to see a doctor. The other 80% is your ability to have a community that's supporting, to have yeah. safe housing, access to food, transportation, education, et cetera. In, in the markets we serve, and we're about 80% of our members are Medicaid members, which means they, have, uh, they, they reach an income threshold, but many of them have multiple diseases and they, you know, many are coming out of prison population. They have substance use disorder, serious mental illness, long-term care issues. So, you know, thinking about somebody, you know, a woman to go get her mammogram, if she doesn't have a place to live and doesn't have access to food, she's not thinking about a mammogram, right? So our ability to get those members supported by community-based organizations, food, housing, mm -hmm. it's a big part of what we do. We, you know, we have full functions in our organization, director of housing, director of prison population, mental behavioral health, mental illness, those mm -hmm. are specialties that we have whole teams around and we take that very seriously because the, the medical part doesn't matter. You're not taking, you're not going worrying about your medication if, if you can't, yeah. if you can't eat and you can't get to the doctor. And yeah. so I think other things we've been really focused on is, you know, how do we, you know, uh, close the digital divide? Not every person has even a smart form. So to get on the phone mm -hmm. and have a check out with your, your primary care, not everybody has Wi-Fi. not everybody has access to mobile devices. Yeah. So we take that very seriously. We've been partnering with, with um, a lot of our community-based organizations to get laptops to people and get Wi-Fi in housing, housing areas and things like that. Well, and probably everybody, as not just with the government health plans, but with all of them, you run into the occasional office or place you're dealing with where they want to fax you something. <laughs> I mean, we talked about, I mean, I just, there are people, there are kids among the millennials, you know, it's sort of like fax machines, you know, I can remember when they were a big deal in the 1980s. Um, right. The um, one of the other things that we talked about, and I thought it was you talked about healthcare technology being in a bit of a state of crisis on its own, and I think it was about the the lack of standards for data exchange and things like that. Talk a little bit about um, how this pandemic period is helping or hindering uh, addressing some of that crisis in in just in healthcare technology. Yeah, I think, and this is this is common to not not just healthcare, but a lot of industries. You know, having the ability to trade data in a standard way, and you know, mm -hmm. that, that's not coming through in a fax machine. Um, it, it's one; it creates just it, it, more flow, and you can think about the supply chain more seamlessly, and you have access to the information. I do think the pandemic is amplifying. There's a lot of things that are happening from a regulatory perspective, and so there's a. a, a uh, several mandates that are coming from from the government, which have been fantastic, called interoperability. So, how do we trade data, clinical data, claims data, um, mm -hmm. even social determinant data, using what they call Fire HL7 standards? So, there there are new standards. The adoption of those things it, it does take time. You know, if you think about, you know, very large, like so, for example, we work with Cleveland Clinic, and they are fantastic and very advanced technically. Yes. Um, they have resources. A local clinic in a rural provider in a rural area that serves very important members of ours, mm -hmm. they don't have the, the financial assets to invest in, you know, data exchange, right? So how yeah. do we take technology and make it accessible to all of those, you know, clinics that are, are you know, supporting very rural members and maybe don't have the ability to buy in, in, in an epic system or a health record system that costs multiple millions of dollars. So we also are really thinking about how do we take our technology and extend it to our providers? They can do a better job with that. But it, you know, accessibility and data exchange, it, it's complicated. And there are still a lot of faxes. But again, for, for a doctor that's running a, a small clinic in a very, very rural area, a half a billion dollar investment in a system is just not something that they can do. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Well, and we've mentioned your technology team a few times. Uh, I know you have about 700 people on your team internally, and then probably about the same number as contractors and external right. um, help. Tell me how you have 
uh, the folks that do work directly for you, um, how do you have your IT organization structured? Did you do any creating of new roles or anything moved around when you joined in the middle of 2019? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for any any new leader joining a company and, and CareSource, we are um, went from a huge hyper growth from a one state plan, a very small to five states over less than five years. Yes. We're in that same growth trajectory over the next five years. So wow. there, I would say it's very much, you know, coming in. And so there had been some mm -hmm. organic growth in the organization structurally. And so what, what I did and what we did as an organization was to simplify some of that structure. So reduce some redundancy and I'll be mean reducing like people reduction, but like all, you know, so all developments done the same way, all testing's done the same way, all infrastructure's done the same way. Consolidate the functions. There's a lot more synergy and, and um, commonality in how we engage with our business partners, even if they're in different states. So we did, we did do a lot of changes. Um, and then I think the other part too, and this has been kind of fantastic. So when, when I first joined the organization, there was a, a, a mindset that the majority of the talent, particularly the executive talent need to be located in Dayton, Ohio. I've moved to Dayton, Ohio with my family from California and we love it, but not everybody is in that situation. And so I think the other thing is the pandemic is it's broken a few of the sort of myths, which is executives have to be in the headquarter location and, and they do, we, we do have uh, executives that travel here, but I think it's help, helped us and many employers to think about their um, talent pool on a more national level and maybe even global level. What that's done though is increase the competition for those really high talent. And I think, so for us, it's been, it's, it's a fantastic thing. And we know we're competing on a national scale. I, I think for us, what we hope is one, um, there's a lot of opportunity for technology to have a huge impact on people's lives and mm -hmm. our mission, which is, you know, in the Medicaid and government populations, we do feel like you have the opportunity. It's sometimes hard to connect tech to, you know, real impact on, on people. Um, and it feels kind of, it can be very consumer oriented. Uh, yeah. This does feel like very mission oriented and it's a fantastic organization. So it's, it's been a lot of change for our team, even, you know, staying connected and, and mm -hmm. keeping our leadership and our culture. It's, it's, it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. Well, you had mentioned too, uh, I think you're so right about that mission basis. Um, I think do they, because uh, I've had several CIOs say to me like, this is so great. We, we were such a have to be there around the conference table kind of company. And now I have this national pool of talent. But of course, the problem is, so does every other CIO exactly. for the most part. But right. I think you get a little bit of a leg up when you have a mission devoted to. Um, yeah. I know because my daughter works in uh, public psychiatry and right. it works with, uh, she runs an addiction clinic uh, in yeah. Newark. Yeah. And it, she wouldn't consider the private world. She's, you know, a young progressive psychiatrist and so she's all about public public works essentially and there's i think that there's a great urge and a, a surge uh toward that in the millennial uh among the millennial workers did you you did mention that you've got 95 percent of everybody is working from home and yeah. now as vaccinations are starting to roll out do you have you uh, talked about, I'm sure you've talked about them, but have you settled any return to work strategies? Are you going to ask or require certain levels? How how are you handling that? Yeah, you know, it's it, we're we're in the midst of it, and I think yeah. we're trying to one prepare our employees. Like, you know, what does this look like? Uh, I we're first and foremost, I, I think we're trying to be very aware of what people's reality is, right? Mm -hmm. It's tough to ask people right now. Not everybody is in school full time. Childcare isn't available for everybody. People aren't in scenarios. They have children that maybe are doing virtual learning. So, or a different, you know, jobs and things are happening. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be very aware of what's happening with our, we do a very regular pulse on our employee base and how are things going. The other thing we're watching is we, um, you know, we work for the government, right? So we need to make sure we're in compliance with those state regulations. And so, so, for example, in our building here, we still have um, uh, spacing issues, right? So people in an elevator in a building that holds 3,000 people in nine, four, nine floors, putting two people in the elevator at a time uh, doesn't make for a lot of, you know, efficiency in terms of you know, everybody's going to get in their seat and then have to go home for dinner. So yeah. there's just a lot of logistics. I think one of the things we are realizing, um, and this goes back to sort of talent pool too, and, and even the mindset we are realizing that people are incredibly effective in remote and in, in, we've given them the tooling to do that and they can be very effective. 
Yes. Um, not every job is right. So, but the majority of them are, and I think what we're, we're, you're going to see, and I think a lot of companies are seeing a lot more flexibility. So, and we're trying to help people also think about, so for managers and, and leaders, so yes, if the majority of your organization is going to be hybrid, I think that's probably what you'll see more and more is the ability for people just to be flexible. Yes. But then how do you create like once a month or once a week where everybody comes in and you do have an all staff and you have that, that engagement and mm-hmm. uh, you have people kind of the, the, the more casual parts, the relationship and then, you know, talk about business too. So I think you'll see a lot more flexibility. Um, we have, we have made changes to our physical footprint as many mm-hmm. companies have, right? So, you know, how do we do more virtual hoteling and, and best use of our virtual space, including uh, tele, you know, te- better, more sophisticated uh, telecom setups in our conference rooms. We have better video access and better sound control. So you have, mm-hmm. we'll see a lot of half the people are in the room and half the people are across the nation on the video, yeah. right? So how do you play with those interactions? Who's talking? Is it just people in the room? So we're talking a little bit about that. So there's just a lot to learn. It's, it's exciting. And I think we also want to give people the time, you know, I mean, we were joking, you know, getting showered and putting on, you know, shoes and getting out of my yoga pants every day and coming into the office is, takes a minute to get that build up. That I know, I know. And I think we got it. We also want to give our, our, our employees the time to transition back at, both yeah. in their personal lives and things they need to manage, but also just that the reality of that's a, a big change. So. Well, and I, you mentioned that too, when we were first talking that um, it, everything slowed down in some ways because you suddenly had more time because you didn't have to factor in the commute. And yeah. I do think there's going to be a little bit of a wrench when you have to, when that goes away. I mean, I I feel that now if I have, you know, a Zoom meeting at 9 a.m., I'm back to getting up at 7 a.m. again, that sort, that sort of thing. We have one of our first questions from our uh, alert listening audience, and it plays right into actually what we've been talking about. What are the next technology investments that CareSource is going to make over the next year or two? I'm thinking they might be in the video conferencing area, but maybe you've already done that investment. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things that I love about um, the where we are is, you know, the healthcare in particular is in, it is in kind of a state of crisis. And the reality is the technology is sort of caught up with some of the imagination. So things like data mm-hmm. movement, data and analytics, which are so vital to what we do, um, it's here. So it used to be a little bit of like, some, you know, some of it's, it's, it's emerging technology, not fully stable, scalable, particularly mm-hmm. highly regulated and highly secure. So we are, um, we, we, we've done all, we, all of our um, equipment in our, our offices have been retrofitted during the pandemic, which is an example of that. We got new carpeting, but we also got new AV and all that. Mm-hmm. One of the investments we're making and we're continuing to make um, are, are really, I would just say thematically around data exchange, exchange of data with third parties, okay. this interoperability work. Um, and it's not that, so we're actually in the middle of implementing um, using the Microsoft Azure technology, which again, mm-hmm. the, the features and functions of those have just, you know, the, the feature points have exploded just in the last year. Um, and we're implementing a data, a data fabric. So we're taking the modern data movement, mm-hmm. right? So streaming and containers and all those kinds of modern data movement, and then matching it with our data platform and, and to really try to create high analytics, predictive models, but also just mm-hmm. access. And, and so that data is yes. more available across the organization and with our third parties. So there's a lot of things we do. So what we want to be able to do is if we get a claim or we get, let's say we get a lab or some event happens with one of our members, we mm-hmm. want their primary care physician to know that that happened. We may be the only partner that that physician knows that that member is having a crisis or an emergency room um, you know, admission, for example. So we may be the only one. We want to make sure that that data gets not just to us in our four walls, but gets to the right yeah. uh, stakeholder in that, what I call the health healthcare supply chain. Well, and along that healthcare supply chain, um, you've got all those different levels of technology sophistication to deal with. Uh, yeah. Does how, how, well, uh, let me ask you then, how does having a data fabric approach how does that help with all that complexity along the supply chain? Because they're not, they're not all going to have, you know, they're not all going to be on an Azure platform and they're not all going to have data fabrics that they're working with. So what does, right. what sort of complexity does that introduce? Well, it, it, to some degree, I think that it's la- the laying down of it creates the investment. What it does is once it's laid down, it, it, um, 
it normalizes. So you don't have to go system to system. So it, it makes it a little bit more ubiquitous. So we can, we can send a flat file. We can sell, we can generate a fax. If somebody needs a fax, we can push okay. the data inbound and outbound in so many mm -hmm. different ways. If the core is designed correctly, you can sort of uh, what our CEO would call hook and unhook in, in a secure and reliable way to almost any way someone needs to connect to us, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's a federally qualified health clinic or you know Cleveland Clinic who has a lot of sophisticated technology, we can yes. do whatever is needed. And so that that is what we're really trying to get at is sort of manage it so everybody doesn't have to be in Azure. They can be wherever they want, however they want. And we can move the data how they need okay. it. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, you had mentioned too that coming in in the middle of 2019, that a few of the first CIO questions that one asks is, "What's the infrastructure in our security position? You know, what what do I need to pay the most attention to?" And you actually found things in pretty good shape. Yeah, it was a nice surprise. So as you come in, I mean, I, I'm sure any any other leader that's when you come into an organization, you just I look at the I look at the ground floor first. Like, what's the what's the foundation when you're yes. buying a house? You know, what's the foundation look like? Mm -hmm. We I'm very lucky, and and the company had made really smart investments, so very reliable and secure and virtualized infrastructure network, etc. Very sophisticated, and, and the, the company had been in I wouldn't say crisis, but it had been those are mm -hmm. intentional investments in security. We have a fantastic chief information security officer who's. Just done some incredible things, both people in process. It's a very mature security posture and a lot of great things that had already been done. We don't, so like for a lot of companies, we don't have a big old mainframe. We don't have a ball and chain of a mainframe we're trying to get out of. We have modern technology at our core. So lucky That's that cool. way. I feel very lucky. So it's nice coming into this role, not really knowing uh, there's a lot to build on, right? So we can think about the more, the high, I would call the higher end of the food chain in terms of modern technologies because mm -hmm. the base is pretty stable, which we're very yeah. lucky. Yeah. Well, that's great because I can remember uh, occasionally I still talk to a CIO who discovers Oh, you know, um, Windows 95 on desktops, that sort of thing. You well, know? I mean, that is, there's a little, there's always a little bit of that out there, but it's uh, not yeah. like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's on the fringe, not at the core. I think technical debt is one of those. Um, I've uh, I've heard one CIO use this kind of visual describing it to an audience one time that I thought was was wonderfully apt because he, he said, picture an iceberg. And the top part of the iceberg is where all the modern stuff happens. You know, it's all frolicking penguins and it's grand and everybody's on their mobile devices. And then he says the foundation is all that big, murky, gray, under the water kind of stuff. So it's, yeah. it must have been a relief to come in and find that a lot of the iceberg had already been kind of lifted up. Um, yeah, I want to yeah. switch... Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about um, back to talent acquisition and your strategies as a CIO. Uh, one of the things that's been a hallmark in your own career is diversity and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What is you, and you said you were very serious about diversity. So how does that translate? And, and we ended up saying that it's really diversity of thought. It's not yeah. necessarily certain numbers of women or people of color. And that sort of thing. So tell uh, tell me about how that develop has developed along in your career, because I'm sure that this was also a carryover from Blue Shield of California. Yeah, it was. And thank you for asking that question. It, it is a, a passion of mine. And I do have to say, you know, it it came from it's a, it's it's learned. And I think uh, I've had some fantastic bosses and my mm -hmm. prior boss in California. I think that was something really important. So when you think about and it, it does come about diversity of thinking. If everybody around you has the same contextual background and the same experience as you do, uh, you're not. It's hard to be creative because everybody's thinking the same. The reality yeah. is, we we also, you know, if we don't like say, let's say digital, like we're really trying to create a, a, a really legitimate d digital strategy for our membership. If we don't understand their context. If all yeah. I understand is my own context and I don't know what it means to be a single mom who is homeless, uh, what that means in terms of accessibility and the digital experience I want to have, we're going to get it wrong. So we do take it very seriously. We've we've done a lot. Uh, one, just I, I have a very diverse network of people. And so our, our teams become very diverse, both in gender and in race and in ethnic and sexual orientation it's a, it's a, it's important for us we take it very seriously at the, at the company i 
uh, personally an executive chair for our Black Employee Network here at the company. And we have lots of uh, employee resource groups that are uh, mm-hmm. affinity groups that help me- employees feel connected. Yes. The other thing we're doing in technology, so in technology, uh, it's a, there's, there's a lot going on, but we don't, there isn't a, a pipeline all the way down to the elementary and high school age for mm-hmm. women and minorities and, uh, you know, for really to get excited about tech. So we've mm-hmm. done a few partnerships. So we we are taking that very seriously. We changed our jobs. So we have entry-level positions that don't require college degrees. We have Great. partnerships mm-hmm. with um, with the state of Ohio for Jobs Ohio, a program where we're creating an IT curriculum where students can graduate from high school with IT certifications and we will give them jobs. So we'll train them as interns. We have several programs where our members who are low income, maybe have disabilities or have mm-hmm. uh, situations in in their kind of non-medical lives where we're putting them through boot camps so they can come out in six, nine months or a year, put them through boot camps, they can have tech certifications and then come work for us or come work for anyone that they have, but creating and creating that pipeline all the way down at the bottom. And we're doing other things like teachers, how do teachers talk about tech, right? So most teachers don't really know a lot about technology and how to think about that as a career because they're teachers. And so we have externships where we have, we have teachers come and sit mm-hmm. in our organization and they learn about technology. They learn about how to bring it back to their uh, students. So there's a, a multi-dimension and we, and we do take it, take it really seriously. That's great. Well, and it's, it's nice that you take it seriously, but you also do realistic, practical things about it every single day. And I mean, I think that that's, you know, it's the, the how you're doing it, I think is is what's so fascinating there. Um, one of the things we were talking about, you mentioned partnerships. Let's talk for a second about uh, vendor and supplier and provider partnerships. Most CIOs have seen, the ones I've talked to recently, have, um, it was kind of a separating the wheat from the chaff with their vendor partners during the pandemic. There were some that really stepped up and others that kind of went uh, rather quiet. Did anything significantly shift for you at CareSource or were all of your previous technology partners, did they all step up and do wonderful things? Yeah, a lot of them did. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think I think what, what we saw <coughs> from our own suppliers is, I'm guessing, and I haven't done a lot of reading, but I, I do think this is true. If you think in the healthcare industry, yeah. particularly also in retail and restaurants, I think companies that were well-structured, well-organized, had a strategy, had the right talent, did yeah. very well in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Others that where there were kind of embedded fractures already struggle, right? And I think that so things like the pandemic, when you put that on top of uh, some fracture or fissure in in their capability and their in their you know structure and their people, things like a pandemic, that level of stressor does tend to make or break uh, mm-hmm. a lot of companies. And so we we've seen that in the healthcare, and I I think we're starting to see as we come out of the re- out of the economic transition and out of the pandemic, I do think the the wheat from the shaft will get will get pretty clear about who's yeah. gonna do well and who won't um a little bit of this is hard to see just in the economic situation right now it's really hard to totally tell that but you can see it right. and what i would tell you is the, the the partners that were real partners not just vendors not just out for revenue mm-hmm. but really thought about our partnership um yes. they continue to be and the others that kind of were on the fringe yeah it's clear to see who's going to proceed forward and I think that's true in the tech space too, right? So a lot oh, of yeah. the emerging technologies, a lot of the um, venture capital base and kind of startup companies, uh, mm-hmm. the ones that have a lot, I mean, they're, they're going to kill it. They're going to come out of this uh, very, very well positioned and others where there's not quite there. I think it's going to be tough for them to recover. Yeah. Well, you made the point about, you know, one major well-known technology company, which we, we won't we won't name any names, but you said that they, you know, they initially were having problems with things they needed to deliver and that they could have whined about it and ex- and made excuses, but they actually doubled down and yeah. that it was impressive to see that. It, it's also nice, too, when you see a very big, very important technology company has to kind of admit, we're not ready for this and like, here's what we're doing about it. And I thought, yeah, 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 that's very real. I would say so there's a couple of uh, what we have platforms where you could Mm -hmm. see the vendors were coming out with products and they were vying for each other. And in this year, I can tell you some have really just 
caught all the way up and sort of now everybody's left in, in their dust. Yes, yes. Uh, and what I mean, like, it's not just about relationship partnership, it's feature points. They are introducing feature points based on what people want and what need, they need and they're testing them and they're very aggressively putting them into their product space. Uh, and like I said, there's a very large one, which we may yes. or may not name, but yeah, it's fantastic. Them. And and that yeah. is what you need to see, right? So you come through the pandemic, and, and there's no question where we're who we're kind of going with because they've Great. invested in us and laid down the right things, and and they're they're you know playing mm -hmm. well with us, and 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 we're getting and our you know employee base and our capabilities are where they need to be. Well, and you, this is especially important for you now because you've got hyper growth heading your way. I think yeah. you mentioned to me that you're aspiring within the next few years to be a $30 billion company. Is that 30 billion? That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So we're, five, we're five states, 10 billion, and we're on a pathway yeah. to be 30 billion in the next five years. Yeah. So hyper that, growth. Yeah. That is hyper growth. Yes. <laughs> is there, um, is there, how do you get ready for that as a CIO? I, you had mentioned a lot of times when I asked CIOs about their relationships with HR, with their HR partner, you know, sometimes they're like, well, let's not talk about that. We'll put that one to the <laughs> side. But I ask you about it here because you were very complimentary of the relationship you've got with HR. So how is it that you're, how, how are you making that work in terms of the hyper growth? And is this something you've always done or did you find that HR at, at, care source was just unusually tapped into your needs. Yeah. So the answer is both. So let me, let me go back to, so the process is a CIO preparing for that level of hyper growth. Um, yeah. There is nothing accidental about it. So we're very methodical. So the very, like mm -hmm. we look at every single layer of the technology and say, what's going to break. And then we make an action plan around it. And we're very methodical mm -hmm. about analysis and identification roadmap, execute, execute, execute. So we spent the last two years doing that. That's on the technology side, it's on the process side, and it's also on the people side. And uh, so, so we've, we've been very systematically, so we have, you know, I, I, we, we got a checklist and we punch through it and we look at it every single month and we make our progress. And, and you know, when, you, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see the progress. When I can look back um, two years, you know, yeah. we went from about 85% availability of our systems to 99.99. We have almost no P1, P2 incidents. We have availability, I mean, there's just, our cost structure is completely different. So yes. that's, it's not accidental. When you get to the HR side, the two things, one, our HR team is fantastic. And I actually think one of the reasons that's fantastic about CareSource as a company, um, our, uh, and part of the reason I moved to, to Dayton, Ohio, we have a pretty fantastic CEO and I never imagined I'd be living in Dayton, Ohio, but he convinced me to move here because he's pretty amazing. But what he's also <laughs> done is assembled a team of people that are, I mean, I happen to be um, I'm an expert in the healthcare space. I happen to have specialized in technology for, the, for my whole career. So right. what I have is a peer group that get our business, they understand how to work together and they happen to specialize in their domain. But there, we are all like, my job, if I'm doing it by myself without my peer group, it's just, I'm just really expensive, right? Like I'm not really, and our, yeah. and our HR partner thinks about, you know, Jennifer, who's our, H, our HR leader, thinks about her organization the same way. So mm -hmm. she knows she has to be an enabler for us. And I know I can't get it done without her team enabling me. So right. we're very thoughtful about how to do that. And it's, you know, long play. These things take time. They don't just accidentally, you don't just go, you know, you don't like, oh, let's see what happens next. It's a very methodical process right. that we're well, and I always, I'm never surprised to hear that from CIOs because so many of you did train as engineers, you know, <laughs> of various sorts. I, I, I do run into the occasional music majors and, you know, that sort of thing. But generally, if you have that disciplined uh, approach in your background, um, that, uh, that, essentially shows up eventually. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that is that I wondered whether, uh, and I've gotten this anecdotally from other CIOs, that the pandemic has highlighted the importance of empathy and company cultures, put it yeah. put them in so much stark relief. And I hear a lot more CIOs these days who sing the praises of their chief HR officers, whereas yeah. A few years ago, I was not hearing that. I, you're always hearing more about resistance to, you know, like, why does this data science employ? Why do they cost so much? You know, I mean, it was more, it was more about the like, oh God, the black hole of expense in IT. And it, it just, <laughs> it seems to have all gone away. Now, again, that's just anecdotal, but I, yeah, are I, you seeing or hearing that in your peer group as well? You know, uh, yeah, for, for sure. And I think when you, when you step back and look, 
we talk a lot about the pandemic, but we also yeah. know we, we're going through the probably most dramatic social, uh, I don't know if you'll call crisis, but transformation of certainly my mm -hmm. lifetime. And mm -hmm. for many of our employees, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and just how, you know, the hate against the Asian culture, there's a lot going on. And yeah. those things are very impactful. So it's easy to look at in the office and we're all here, we normalize our environment. But when mm -hmm. you think about our employee base and where they live in the community they're living and this, the, the frustration and the strife and the, and the difficulty that they're living through, it does require you know, the first thing we started doing and our, our CEO started doing it and, and, I, and I did it with my team was just, uh, we would just have meetings and it was just listening. There was no agenda. There was no business. It's right. just, hey, everybody, let's just check in. What's take happening in other. your world? Yeah, mm -hmm. what's happening in your world? And a lot of emphasis on take care of each other, take care of yourself, take care of each other, reach out. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are IT engineers who are super introverted and they love to be working from home. And there's a lot of people that mm -hmm. are struggling with the isolation because they they are home and they were a lot like completely alone. And yeah. so I think there's a lot of empathy. Yeah, I, and I think that's just generally as a leader, I think we're learning that's a, a big shift. You didn't talk about, you know, I say I'm human first, and there wasn't a lot of <laughs> there weren't a lot of executive leaders probably ten years ago to talk about empathy and human human that's but right. i i yeah. my my experience is the best leaders do because at the end of the day you're, mm -hmm. you're just people you can only get done with what people can and they people need to be yeah. seen and they want to feel cared about they want to be part of something uh so that's genuine and and so we do yeah. try to try to do that you have to i think it unravels if you if mm -hmm. you don't or can't well it's just it's sort of like it's very difficult to fake sincerity because people feel it and i think it's hard to fake authenticity too it's, yeah i would yeah. say you can you can smell whether somebody can likes you, you know, or is paying attention. Yeah. People know. Yes. They can tell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know we were talking about that before we got on the air about how, you know, all this space underneath from, from kind of like chest level down, you right. know, you could be doing all sorts of things and no one would know because your hands are moving under there. But yep. whether people are paying attention um, is, uh, I, I think, something that you just kind of intrinsically know, even over uh, a medium like video conferencing, where we can't truly make eye contact. If we want to make eye contact, we have to look into the little green dot, that sort of thing. Let's yeah. um, let's talk more about top business and technology initiatives that you have common, uh, key technology projects. Uh, you know, we already talked a little bit about the data fabric, but you also make a lot of use of very sophisticated AI these days. Yeah. And I know that I don't think I ever run into a CIO who doesn't have a major data strategy unfurling, unwinding, ramping up. So let's talk about your data strategy and also about the AI aspects that are are helping your business today. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. It's my earlier comment where the technology is finally catching up with the imagination. It's, you know, AI and ML, it's, and truly for a, from a technology perspective, it's like embedded in everything. So every product, every component, network switching, security, uh, you know, everything it's got embedded AI and ML and it's fascinating even mm -hmm. things that are you know our operations and monitoring and things like that there's a lot of really fantastic technology that's built in mm -hmm. from a capability perspective so that's that's something we look at and we demand from our from our vendors and they show up and they're embedding AI and ML into their capabilities which makes our work so much easier automate so it's really automation right Mm -hmm. A lot, though, when we think about the healthcare space and the supply chain, a lot I think on the continuum of AI to L, everything from bots, we have a lot of automation, um, a lot of new kind of predictive modeling and analytics. And so taking, you know, access is, again, the data movement and the access to the data and the ability for them, the business to then create triggers for those things to learn from themselves. It takes one, it takes technology, but it also takes really smart business people that understand our business so that yeah. they understand what questions should you be asking because just to have analytics and the data all there if nobody knows what questions you're asking or things you're trying to explore or solve for again yeah. it just becomes expensive so we have some really fantastic folks that deeply deeply understand our business and our analytics organization and they do some, mm -hmm. some really cool predictive modeling and we have vendors that do that right in high acuity spaces you know disease management and things like that there's a lot of companies that are doing yeah. this really at scale and it's very cool yeah 
Are there particular technologies, especially you mentioned all of the fascinating startups and some of the companies that are probably really going to accelerate faster in the coming year or two because of the technologies they were working on, how far along they were. Um, are there anything, is there anything that is very, I know you do a lot of work that's innovative and some leading edge. So is there any emerging trend that is of greater interest to you than some of the others? Yeah, I think where I, where you're seeing, oh, I'm personally just seeing a lot of movement and, and, and sophisticated, both in sort of capability and technology is in what I call the special populations, so the really high acuity. So behavioral mm -hmm. health, uh, substance abuse, uh, serious mental illness, sort of really high acuity spaces that are all very complex scenarios. You know, when you can look at um, sort of like things like, you know, the health of water in certain mm -hmm. environments and then weather patterns and then correlate that to disease that may be emerging and in, you know, vaccinations that are required, that's really sophisticated stuff. And that's that's where you're seeing a lot of things mm -hmm. pop up, more predictive, more uh, preventative. Um, yeah. And you know, how do you really help a member? So, so for example, what we're seeing is a lot of investment in behavioral health, but when you invest in behavioral health, your medical costs go down, right? So people go, oh gosh, you know, right. it's too expensive. Well, no, the other side of that coin is very, very, very expensive because yeah. the of somebody just deteriorates at a, at a rate. So there's a lot of really interesting companies that do tech, that do analytics, Mm -hmm. um, and then also just do care management in pretty sophisticated ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and we had talked um, uh, when we were getting ready for this meeting today, we talked about the difference in what a managed care company understands about healthcare and how it's changing and the way it works and the advantage that that gives you. Because managed care is actually uh, more complex than even than even just regular health insurance or even property insurance. Um, right. Why why is that? Talk a little bit more about why there is complexity and a certain level of kind of capability around managed care that when it's developed over time, it really becomes an important part of what a company is doing, especially a company like CareSource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure we've completely as a I would say at a global Scale, really kind of crack the nut here. So when, when, when you think about this and the digital space for me is, is very interesting. So we, we figured out how to do consumerization, Amazon and Uber and things like that. And mm -hmm. they're very transactionally oriented. The reality is managed care is human based and it's a very complicated. Every human wants an interaction that's personalized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've talked even to your, the IDG team is doing a lot of research on this. So, so a healthcare scenario where you're going to a primary care to get just a checkup is a very different experience than being admitted to an ER. That's a very contextual, yes. very different experience. What you want, what you need, how that should work, the data that's required, the stakeholders that are involved, it's totally different stakes, right? Mm -hmm. So that I think that uh, the human angle to this and the complexity and the number of variations uh, mm -hmm. makes it very complicated. And yeah. so it's not just a, it's not just a bunch of algorithms and scripts. There, there's a, a variation to it that does make it complicated. And it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, there are things and actions that happen because healthcare is global. Everybody's got, if you can take the data and aggregate it, you start to see patterns very, very quickly. And so instead of just a fingers crossed approach, let's see what happens next. You can yeah. predict at some level of, of what could happen next or what I could do. And you see that a lot in the, um, in the physician space. There's a lot of really interesting things that are happening in medical devices and, and uh, monitoring and things like that in mm -hmm. both remote and in uh, the, the, the office setting that I think are also fantastic, but it's a complicated space. Mm -hmm. You know, people are not simple and help well, people. So, so true. So true. Well, and I was also thinking how pre pandemic, I, I keep thinking in terms of like the before times and the current times and pre pandemic. One of the things I used to talk with a lot of CIOs about was relationship and cooperation with the business side because many CIOs especially off the record will tell you that you know it's they're always trying to learn the business and what they'd like to see is a little more of that business trying to learn a little bit about technology kind of coming in from that other side how do you think the uh, operating through the pandemic now <clears throat> for over a year how is the how are you seeing that relationship 
between uh, technology organizations and the businesses they work with. Um, yeah. How is that changing? And are these changes, do you think they'll stick? Yeah, I, I, this is my opinion. I, I think there was a trend way in advance of the pandemic. And I think it's one of those things that sort of, again, weep from the shaft. So executives yeah. and leaders, and not even just all the way over the C-suite executive, but you know, any leader for um, technology is an embedded part of every business. Yes. I think that's a true statement. <laughs> and if you're a business leader and don't understand, not that you have to know how to code, but I, I frankly, I think everybody should know how to code because it demystifies <laughs> a lot. Like we think it's also, you know, this big black yeah. box. It's not that, it's not, you know, break yeah. it down a little. Um, I think any business leader that is choosing to think of technology as a black box, as the other side of the mm -hmm. fence, it's pretty risky from a career perspective. And I think what the pandemic has shown is, again, I think people that don't really know how to partner and think about, and I say the technology, but also HR and your service functions, how to embed those capabilities inside your business from a P&L and an operation of how do you launch things in the market, not really knowing how those things work and, the, and how to get the organization behind it, create context, how to mm -hmm. enable those things. I, I think it's tough to be successful as a business leader and still think of those things as other. I, I don't think you get the right. luxury of that anymore. And I think I've, certainly what I've seen in the pandemic is um, leaders that opt for that, like, oh, I'll just, you know, other side of the fence for technology, um, yes. it, it, they'll, they'll struggle. And I, I don't, I think that's a tough mm -hmm. place to go. And I don't think you have, again, you don't have to be a coder, but um, it'd be like me saying, oh, I don't really need to understand how we pay claims. I just need to run the system. That's right. not a fair right. example for my, me either, right? So. Right. Well, and it, it's really interesting because I don't think two or three years ago, it would have been considered any kind of a career downside if you were on a business function, if you just ignored those people over in the tech organization. And yeah. I, I think that's that's actually very astute that it, you're pointing out something that if they're not getting with the program right now, they probably ought to, you know, that ought to yeah. go on, on the to-do list. Um, yeah. And for my, uh, for, for our wrap up question here, I, I wanted to ask you, what has the past year uh, and the pandemic, what have these challenges taught you as a leader? How has it changed mm -hmm. your own approach to your own leadership behaviors? Uh, you're probably pretty type A, you probably get a lot done. You've got an engineering Can you mind. Tell? Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, well, I, type A's, we always kind of recognize each other, you know? Um, I, so, and uh, what what has this taught you? What are you taking away from all of this as as a leader? Yeah, I, I breathe deeply because I actually think, I, when this all started, I, I told my boss, Earhart, I said, you know, gosh, there is some big stuff that I'm going to learn for this. I don't know what it is, but I can feel it. This <laughs> is kind of crazy. And so we're going to yeah. figure out what this is going to be. I, I think a couple of things. One, um, slowing down. I think it's forced us all to slow down um, and to, uh, um, I was, and probably still am to some degree, a little bit uncomfortable with slow, quiet, mm -hmm. reflective, dead zone, uh, getting yeah. much more comfortable with that, letting, uh -huh. you know, and also just listen, none of us, if you'd asked me in March, I think for many of us, you, some people were smart enough to say, oh, it's going to be a two-year cycle for this pandemic. I thought it was going to be like a six-month cycle. So yep. that whole not really able to predict what's next and to be confident and comfortable and help people around you be okay with the unknown. That's an amplified skill for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think also just like self-care. I, I think for all of us, uh, you know, I can't, if I'm not taking care of myself and helping the people around me take care of themselves, we, we all are just going to show up, you know, kind of all crazy at the office space. So um, yeah, slowing down and <clears throat> maybe letting go little less control and just trusting the people around me and trusting what's going to happen next and some resilience uh, for sure. I think probably, um, yeah. yeah, big, big, big badge of resilience right here for all of us. <laughs> well, and I've had, uh, I've had conversations with CIOs. Uh, we've done a couple of um, IDG CIO events just about where the topic is business resiliency or just resiliency. And there is an amazing number of facets to that. You know, it yeah. used to be if we said it in the pre-pandemic times, it meant keeping all your systems up. 
but there's much more of a, I think, a global humanistic approach that everyone's been taking. Um, well, as I, as I thought it might, our hour has flown by. Thank you so much for joining me today, Devin. I thought this was a wonderful conversation. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It was a yeah, great conversation. And I do appreciate all that, that you guys do, the CIO Magazine and IG, for, for the role of CIO and technology team. So thank you for having me. And You're totally our pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks so much to our listening and watching audience. If you joined us late today, you can watch the full episode later on LinkedIn, but also on CIO.com and YouTube's IDG Tech Talk channel. CIO Leadership Live is available as an audio podcast as well, wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Devin Valencia of CareSource as much as I did, and that you'll join me for our next episode of CIO Leadership Live, which will be two weeks from today on Wednesday, May 19th at noon Eastern, when I'll be joined by CIO Russ Carlotto of Clemson University in South Carolina. Thanks again for joining us today, and please do take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel, IDG Tech Talk, where you can find all of our previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live. I've been telling people lately that they're eminently bingeable, but that may be more of an impact about the pandemic and how we'll watch anything these days. Stay well, and I hope we see you here again next time. Take care.